I'll tell you what defines a behavioral emergency. Right. So behavioral emergency basically is it's when behavior around the people that you're closest to becomes intolerable. They may be used to your antics or the way that you do your, your mannerisms and things like that. But once your antics or the way that you do things become an extreme and the people around you can no longer tolerate it, then that's when it's considered a behavioral emergency. Um, so behavioral, behavior intolerable to the patient or those around him, elements of concern for the patient's safety and well-being of that and that of others, unusual behavior or evidence of an unusual thoughts. Um, which of the following would be considered a mental illness? A stress reaction, depression, anxiety, or all the above? I'm going to give it one more shot if it don't work this time. <laughs> I'm not going home, but... All right, so all the above, stress reaction, depression, anxiety, every one of them, that's what I was just talking about just a minute ago. So degrees of mental illness, anxiety, depression, stress reaction, personality disorders, psychotic disorders, even addictive behaviors. So you're telling me that somebody that is an alcoholic or addicted to substances or they have some type of uh, mental illness? Yes, they do. And then that's what defines a behavioral emergency, what we just talked about. Um, so here's the thing about these patients. They can't be grouped together any more than patients with other medical problems. Basically, that's a nice way of saying they can't just be labeled as crazy no matter what their mental illness is. They may have bipolar issues, or manic depressive issues, psychiatric issues, depressive issues. It doesn't mean that they're just all placed under this umbrella category of being crazy. It means that each patient, each one of these patients has some type of medical problem, just like you can't say that a person that, that has high blood pressure is in the same category as somebody that has congestive heart failure. They're different illnesses um, and, and they're very diverse and, and that's what I want you guys to look at is that, that these patients are going to be unique but you've got to understand and this is where some of that uh, reasoning comes in some of that critical thinking comes in is the fact that you're going to have to treat them differently you may not ever get a blood pressure or an IV or anything on these patients you may simply just have to work with what you got just by talking them into getting on the back of your ambulance and to take them into the hospital. Maybe all the treatment that you can provide them. Impending violence. Everybody been around somebody who's violent before? Everybody been in a situation where you could just tell, hey, that joker's about to fly off his or her rocker. They're about to go go nuts. They're about to go spider monkey on somebody's head. Do they have some of this stuff? Restlessness, fidgeting, clenched fizz, just so mad. Anybody got those kind of people in your life that kind of make you that way? I do. I'm married. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never be violent. I'm not a violent person. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, what does body language tell you? <laughs> Give me your lunch money? Are you big fun as a kid? Yeah, I'm 
Is there a difference in me just standing like this? Hey guys, good morning. And good morning. There is. There is. There's a big difference just in body language and posture. Um the the bad thing about these types of situations is that oftentimes it means that there's going to be an element element of violence involved. <coughs> Maybe not necessarily towards you, but it might even be to themselves, or it might be to others, or there's that potential of violence. That's the thing about these types of patients is that you've always got to be planning your next step ahead. That's where some of these situations come in that you learn about in EMT, where you always have a route of egress, right? You never allow the patient to get between you and your exit. You never allow yourself to be put in a situation to where you have nowhere to go. Right? You never approach a scene without it being safe or without having backup there. And again, about scene safety, you've got to remember one thing about law enforcement. Law enforcement is, is trained to enforce the law. They're not medically trained. Some of them are, but their particular job at that time is to enforce the law. So you may even run into some conflict in that situation. Because they may see a patient who has a psychiatric issue, I'm going to give you an example in just a few minutes, as a, a person that is just exhibiting violent behavior and a, a, a person that needs to be incarcerated or a person that needs to be arrested, and you may view that patient as somebody who is sick, and yes, you do need some type of restraint, you need some type of... of of safety measures, but they don't need to go to jail because jail's not going to do anything for them. They need to go to the hospital where they can have a mental evaluation and be under care that way. Um, <clears throat> so you should trust law enforcement to secure the scene, but you've got to remember this. Just because that the law enforcement officer says, hey, it's safe right now, doesn't mean that five minutes later it's going to be safe then. Scene safety is dynamic, which means it changes, right? It, it means it, it, it's always, I'm looking the next step ahead, right? Restraints. When do you restrain a patient? Okay, so yeah, you, you do have to have medical direction. You do have to have permission from your uh, med control doctor. But what situations would indicate for you to restrain somebody? They're a threat to themselves. They're a threat to themselves or they're a threat to you or bystanders, folks around, right? One of the most unnerving situations is to be in the back of an ambulance by yourself with a patient who is laid off, with a patient who is restrained. And I had that situation. Um, when you're approaching these patients, Another thing that you need to remember is that if they're having a behavioral emergency or a psychiatric emergency, some type of mental illness, they may lash out. They may throw personal insults your way. They may cuss you out. But you know what? If it isn't you, it's going to be somebody else. It'll be the other responder. Or it'll be the police officer. Or it'll be their mom or their, their son or their brother or their sister or daughter. It's not a personal attack against you. In most situations, you're not going to know that patient from Adam, right? So how are they going to really know what to do to, to personally attack you? They're not. So again, this is where some of that ethics comes in, where you've got to remember that I'm a professional, I've got a job to do, and if this patient was in his right mind, if this patient wasn't exhibiting signs and symptoms of this mental illness, most likely he would not or she would not be throwing physical or verbal attacks my way. You've got to maintain a confident and relaxed approach. Meaning, you can never allow that patient to control the situation, to control the scene. Oftentimes, these patients are manipulative. 
Oftentimes, these patients are very loud and very controlling of conversation. You've got to continue to remember, you've got to reroute these conversations, and you've got to be in control of this situation. And that doesn't mean that you just tell that patient, sit down and shut up and don't talk. But what that does mean is that you maintain the authoritative uh, figure in that situation. How do you do that? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Huh? Yeah, I mean, just be confident. Don't let them expose any of your weaknesses. I mean, yeah, you're going to be nervous, you're going to be scared, but don't let them expose your weaknesses. All right? A lot of situations, you've got to display outwardly the complete opposite of what you're feeling inwardly. And that is, that is an art, that is a skill that you eventually will get. Because you've got to be able to maintain control of the situation. Maintain control of the situation. Take note of general living conditions. This can just tell you a lot about the patient themselves. You've got to be empathetic and non-judgmental. What's the difference in empathy and sympathy? Empathy is trying to understand. Sympathy is just saying, oh, I feel sorry for you, but I'm glad I'm not in your situation. Right. The example I always use, Hannah could have failed a test, and I say, as an instructor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It breaks my heart that you made an F. That's sympathy. I'm sorry that you, you made that bad grade. Empathy says, well, you know, I, I know that you had a really tough week this past week. I know you haven't been able to study. Um, you, you did not do well in your test. Let's see what we can do to work towards getting you to do better in the class, right? So empathy is almost putting your boots on the ground. It, it, it's taking action with your feelings of the way that patient's going through. Um, also, any altered mental status patient, any patient that's not acting as we would say normal, should have a blood glucose level check. Also, medications. Because a lot of times, exacerbations of a mental illness has something to do with a change in their medication. Either the doctor has changed their dosage of medication or completely changed the medication to a different one, or their levels just aren't working anymore. And then also, interview family and friends separately. What are some, some of the questions that you would need to ask the folks that are around these people the most? Is this normal? What's different today? What made you call 911 for this patient? Why, why do you think that this patient is acting this way? Have they had some kind of emotional trigger? Um, have they had a lot of anxiety? Have they been under a lot of stress lately? Um, has there been any changes with their medication? Anything like that? Um, so what is the most effective tool for assessment and treatment with mental illness or behavioral emergency? Try it. Way to calm those patients down? Mm -hmm. No, no. We don't have medications at AMT to, to, to do anything with the patients, and their restraints are a last ditch, last resort. So, just like with all the uh, other medications that we talked about with the other medical emergencies, it's important to know at least some of the more common medications simply for the fact that they may not be able to give you any type of history. In some situations, these may be frequent flyers or patients that we see often, so we may kind of have an understanding of their background and all that. But um, just about 
almost every one of these medications up here, Prozac, Celexa, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, Cymbalta, Wellbutrin, turn on your TV at any time and you'll see a commercial for these medications. Antidepressant medications are just out there everywhere. Antipsychotics, some of the more common ones, Zyprexa, Seroquel. Seroquel also can um, work as a sleeping medication as well. Um, Abilify, Haldol is an old one, Thorazine is an old one. And then other medications used for mental disorders, Lithium. What is lithium used for? Bipolar, Bipolar or manic depressive disorder. Uh, Clonazepam, lorazepam, aprazolam, what do you notice about all these? Am, pam, am, pam. That means that they're benzodiazepines. What, what, what have I told you in the past? What's a benzo do? It's a sedative, right? It, 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 it kind of chills the central nervous system out, right? So a lot of people take Ativan or Xanax if they have high anxiety because it kind of chills them out. Um, Enderol. Propranolol, what, what do you notice about that? Lol, that's a beta blocker, but it's also a medication used for chronic migraines. Um, valproic acid is Depakote, often used with seizures. You've got Tegretol, Gabapentin, or Neurotin, used with diabetic neuropathy. All of these medications, every one of these medications up here, affect the central nervous system in some form or fashion. So these are the patients that you might want to do a mental status exam. Now this is different than you're looking at the AIO UTIPs or the AFU or GCS. This is actually kind of understanding where they're at because you know there's a difference and being alert and oriented and just being alert, right? I can be awake but not be oriented to my surroundings. And so you may need to try to look at some of these questions to see kind of where they're sitting. Level of responsiveness. Orientation to person, place, and time. Ability to sustain attention and concentrate, often a, a issue with patient with some folks with people having psychiatric emergencies. Disorders of perception, the way they perceive things, hallucinations, illusions, delusions. Um, well, delusions fall a little bit more under disordered thinking. Affect, what is affect? Those of you that have this courage class, you did affective domain. We're going to do affective domain in here. What was that a, a um, assessment of? Your attitude, your overall countenance, just the way that you 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 look. If I said a patient had a flat affect, what did that mean? They're just kind of indifferent, right? They're just, they just got a flat look on their face. They're just indifferent. They don't care, right? And then we're going to look at their behavior, too. Is it an extreme behavior? Is this, is this situation going to fall under um, behavioral emergencies? Your clinical reasoning. One thing you've got to remember about a patient with a psychiatric disorder is that they just because they have a history of a psychiatric disorder doesn't necessarily mean that the reason why you're called today is because of a manifestation of that psychiatric disorder. What if you had a patient that had schizophrenia but is also a diabetic? Right? Or what if you had a patient who, who is manic depressive but had a traumatic injury where it affected their brain, right? So you've got to do a full assessment. You can't just chalk it up that, oh, I've been to this patient before and I know that they've got a mental problem, so this is probably what's wrong with them. You've got to do a full assessment. There are several things that can cause altered ways of thinking, altered mental status, and all that. Um, 
one of the biggest errors you can make that can bite you in the behind is if you just label a patient as a psychiatric or behavioral emergency and never check your medical issues. Because a lot of times it could just be something as simple as a blood sugar of 15 or blood sugar of 30 that we can fix. An assumption that a history of mental illness is causing the current problem could be deadly. How is this possible? How is it possible that just assuming this patient has mental illness could be deadly? Right. Or they could be having a, a diabetic emergency, a stroke, heart issues. I mean, and the list goes on and on. So that's why, no matter what, you still have to do a thorough assessment. And these are just some other medical issues or traumatic issues that could cause um, behavioral emergencies. So again, therapy and communication. Maybe the only treatment that you provide some of these patients. But always treat your injuries and medical conditions. Establish a baseline. And how, how will we establish a baseline? Yeah, inquiring with the family, getting them history. And then also, if we actually have to restrain them, then we've got to do a whole different assessment on them because we've got to make sure that they're not injured or they don't get injured, injured bad. So to make a, a field diagnosis or a clinical decision that this is a mental illness or behavioral emergency, only happens secondary to doing a full assessment and going through and ruling out any other possible medical problems. Now, that doesn't mean that it takes 30 minutes to do that. That means that we do a quick assessment, we, we go head to toe, we assess blood sugar, we do things like that. And then if all that's cleared up, yeah, then we can definitely um, um, consider what this is. Now, you can also rely a great deal on history. You can rely a great deal on the, the family members, especially in these situations, because oftentimes these are going to be poor historians. They're not going to be able to tell you what was going on with them. Um, and, and if you do have um, unexplained changes in vital signs or extremes of vital signs, don't ignore them. Treat this patient like a medical patient and then move forward. Common signs and symptoms with this disorder include tachycardia, tachypnea, sweating, feelings of impending doom, and the list could go on and on. So there's 11 of y'all in here. Try to get 11 responses. Anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders. One of the big causes of tachycardia is releases of epinephrine stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. Anxiety is a big cause of that. Anybody know anybody with excessive anxiety? Someone that has severe anxiety that's uncontrolled, it really um, messes up their standard of living, their quality of life. It's not an issue that, that I've ever had, but I, I've taken care of several people that have anxiety issues. And I, I know people close in my family that, that have to take medication because just out of the blue, they'll just start having anxiety attacks. Now, these are some rather um, difficult patients to take care of in the field because you're trained and you know you want to try to do all this stuff, oxygen, all this stuff, but oftentimes it's just trying to coach them and get them to calm down. So some of your anxiety disorders include your panic disorders, which are your, your, your most common ones. Phobias, OCD, acute stress, PTSD. PTSD is, is a really dangerous one. 
and it doesn't just affect military. It can affect any one of you guys in here. All it takes is just a severe, a bad call, and it may just flip a light switch in your brain. Um, anxiety disorders are common and are not always recognized or diagnosed. Um, if this is a patient's first anxiety attack, they may feel like they're dying. And it's very, very real to them. And that's one of the hardest things that I've had to wrap my mind around is that I know that this patient isn't dying. I know that all that's wrong with them is the fact that they're just, they, they're anxious. They, they got an anxiety. But I can't get that through to their mind. And so that's where therapeutic communication and, and coaching them is going to uh, come be very important. So again, some of your signs and symptoms that we've already talked about. Um, so some of the uh, problems with anxiety is just the fact that some of your more serious medical conditions can have some of the same feelings. Chest pain, sweating, feeling of impending doom. And so again, you can't just chalk it up to they're having an anxiety attack. You've got to do a full medical assessment. When a patient has an anxiety attack, especially if it gets really bad to where it's uncontrolled and 911 has to be called and all that, um, oftentimes they go through this depersonalization or just a, 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 a loss of rationalization, a loss of reality. There's nothing that you can tell them that's going to get them to calm down. If they think they're going to die, they they really feel like they're about to die. One of the worst feelings in the world is to lose control, to not have control of your own emotions and not have control of your own actions. You're really going to have to be empathetic with these patients. You're really going to have to try to understand and to be confident but to try to coach them through these situations. <clears throat> Delirium. Which one is it? Acute onset of a confusional state with underlying correctable cause or progressive deterioration of mental function, including memory impairment? to fear and combative behavior. Just a total loss of control or not understanding what's going on in that situation. All right. Um, let's take a break. I got 925. Let's just do a five minute break.
All right. All right, so going back, um, delirium is acute onset, confusional state with underlying correctable cause. What does that mean, underlying correctable cause? Yeah, yeah, so, so, right, right, so there's some type of outside influence, right? It's something affecting the brain and not the brain itself, right? Could be blood sugar, could be hypothesis, could be some type of drug, something like that. Um, <coughs> dementia, on the flip side, is something that, that actually affects physically the brain tissue, right? A progressive disorder, it, it makes changes in the brain and it leads to altered ways of thinking. Um, <coughs> both can uh, involve uh, confusion, lead to fear, combative behavior. Now, here's the thing, just like we talked about in, in neuro disorders, their age should not be a factor when evaluating the risk to your safety, right? We talked about those little old 80-year-old ladies that, that uh, can whoop your tail, right? They can beat you down if you're not careful. Not necessarily saying that you're ready to bow up and come to blows with an old person or anything like that, but you can't, you can't just discount, hey, this is just a little old lady because I've been I've been in situations uh, before where we've actually taken several grown men to hold, you know, that little old lady or man down to actually restrain them. Um, the thing about delirium and dementia is the fact that they've lost any sense of um, any sense of reality. So they're scared. They don't know what's going on. And you've got to be the, the, the foundation. You've got to be the, uh, the person that, that maintains in control and understands this, right? Being calm and collected. What are three eating disorders? We're going to move on past uh, dementia and things like that. What are three eating disorders? Involved eating. Involved eating. Binge eating. Anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. What populations do eating disorders affect the most? All. Okay, it does, but there, it, one population is more prevalent than others. Great girls. Young women. But it is increasingly affecting men. Um, don't affect me. I don't like to eat. Do what? Eat your Beaver fans, skinny jeans, things like that. <laughs> no. Um, and there's just a, a a different way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking. And and in all honesty, um, there is a societal uh, 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 image of what perfection is. And a lot of times these folks get caught up into that. Um, why do you think we need to, to know about this? Yeah, um, we're not necessarily going to get called to somebody because they've got an anorexia or that they're, they're throwing up their food or they're binge eating, like you have a great mom. Um, but it does affect electrolytes, it does affect nutritional imbalances in the body, right? I mean, these folks are virtually getting no nutrition. So what happens when you start losing nutrition in your body? Things don't work right, right? So oftentimes we may get them because they're unresponsive or they're just very sick, right? Um, I personally have never uh, seen somebody with anorexia, but I've seen pictures. Um, you can definitely tell that there's some kind of issue. And the thing about it is, is that it is a mental perception, a mental issue, right? This girl with anorexia does not see a thin, frail, 
body when she looks into a mirror. Her perception is so distorted that she does not see this. She sees something else, right? <clears throat> um, so these are the patients that, that they've got these extreme dietary restrictions and then they, they exercise like all day. And so they're not getting good nutrition and then they're further taxing their body by doing exercise and all that. And then they take laxatives and diuretics, which is further draining fluid from their body, further draining electrolytes from their body. So these patients may be very dehydrated, um, very malnourished. And so these are the things that we're going to uh, have to assess for. Bulimia, these are... Um, these are patients that they don't really restrict the diet, but they just yak it all back up after they eat. Um, they're obsessed with losing weight, and they take on a very vicious cycle of just tearing up some groceries and then puking it all back up, right? Filling it all back up. This brings on a different level of damage to the body. Number one, they're malnourished, they're not getting electrolytes, they're not getting nutrition, but what else would excessive vomiting do? It would destroy your digestive tract, destroy the, mu the mucosa of the, the, the mouth, even it's running the risk of uh, aspiration, right? And then binge eating disorders, these are, these are uh, people that, that they're generally obese, they eat a lot, you don't really do anything about it, and, and that's a psychiatric issue as well. A lot of times folks find comfort in food, that's what they do, they eat. Right? Kind of where I fall with chips ahoy cooking. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll sit and I'll be the whole thing for that and I'll not even realize it. You know, it's just like one more, just one more, and I'll stop. I'll do And then you drop that one cookie in the bottom of the milk, and then it's like, oh, I gotta got get a couple more. And it's, and it's, <laughs> if y'all if, if don't, don't face those kind of issues, you're like, I'm just going to learn. Um, but anorexia and these, they, they don't just affect the way somebody looks. I mean, there's actually some pretty dire um, issues that it affects with your heart, your circulation, even your kidneys. So it, it, they could be in a, a true medical emergency. I mean, it, it, their acid base balance gets messed up. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong with them. Um, so, 10 million females in the United States and a million males suffer from this. And this is an older, uh, couple years old statistic, so it might be even higher now. Um, they know what's going on. They know the, the physical risk. And as a matter of fact, I saw not too long ago, well, it's probably, I, I've told this before, and, and that might have been last year. Um, I used to saw things like on Dateline or 2020 or something like that. They actually have anorexia support groups, but it's not the support that you would think. It's not like, oh, I'm going to help you overcome this. It's like, I've got anorexia, Peter's got anorexia, Acton's got anorexia. We're going to post online what to do to lose more weight and to, to support the weight loss deal and, and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, a lot of times these patients are very well informed. It's just that they've got this distorted mental picture of themselves. Distorted mental image. Um, you know, I, I just don't. I don't understand. You know, and again, that's where you have to be empathetic. You may not understand, but you still got to treat that patient, right? Physical symptoms with a without apparent physiological cause. Factitious disorders, mental disorders, somatoform disorders, or psychosis. So we're getting into some different kinds of disorders. Let me get caught up with my notes here. And 
these fall under factitious and somatoform disorders. Um, <laughs> factitious disorders are characterized by intentional infliction of physical or psychological signs and symptoms in oneself or others. The motivation is to assume the sick role or the role of the caretaker or of a sick person. Munchausen. Anybody ever heard of Munchausen's? So you've got Munchausen's where I myself am trying to manifest these different um, signs and symptoms to make folks think I'm sick. And then you've got Munchausen's by proxy, and it's where I'm, in, I'm, I'm the caregiver of someone, and I'm constantly making them sick. What do you think the primary motivation for this is? Mm -hmm. It's really not. Sympathy, the, just the feeling of, of somebody feeling sorry for them. Um, attention. These, these patients are often seeking attention. Um, then somatoform disorders, they're kind of crazy. Physical symptoms without apparent uh, physiological cause. This patient is, is displaying physical signs and symptoms of a disease that they do not have. Or they get very fixated on, on certain disorders to where it becomes very real and apparent to them. There, there are cases of folks who actually are so... Um, well, this... This actually falls under body dysmorphic disorder, preoccupied with physical defect and not apparent to others. There's people that are so fixated with, with certain things of their body that they actually want to have them removed. Like, there's literally a, a, um, a group of people that go to the doctor to request a limb to be amputated that's perfectly healthy. I've, I've, I've actually seen a documentation, a doc, whatever, of that before. I think it was on the same night as that, that thing about the uh, anorexia and all that. I mean, these people actually go to the doctor and, and ask to have a limb, a leg, an arm, or something cut off because there's a physical defect in their mind that's not really there, and they can't overcome that. Um, conversion disorder, sudden loss of specific neurologic function following a severe stressor. These are, you could kind of put these people in the same category of the, the folks that, that get bad news and fall out, you know, pass out, lose, lose function because of, of something that's just stressed their body out. Um, with factitious disorder patients, this is what I was talking about just a minute ago, um, there's no external gain from this behavior as far as like materialistic stuff. They're not trying to get money, they're just trying to get attention. If they're doing it for money, then it's called a malingering. It's called malingering. Some of these patients, they, they get pretty serious about these, these uh, fictitious disorders and these metaphorical disorders. They'll physically inject themselves or inject their loved ones with things to make them sick. Um, anybody ever watched that uh, trauma in the ER, life in the ER? Mm -hmm. There was an episode on that where this lady had a kid that, that, for whatever reason, I can't remember exactly why, he had a central line that he it just stayed in, an IV access that stayed in, um, and he kept getting sick, kept getting sick, kept getting sick, and they couldn't figure out why. Well, when he got to the hospital, he was perfectly fine, then all of a sudden he got really, really sick again. And the doctor, something clicked in his mind, he was like, well, let, let's... Um, Let's, let's put these radioactive tracers in his body. And I can't remember exactly. He put it, he put it in something, a, a substance. I can't remember if it was like a, some of his old blood or, or urine or something. But they put it in something that the mom was drawing with a syringe out and injecting in his body. And so they actually took him to uh, radiography and were able to trace this stuff to see that his mom had actually injected him with something to make him sick. That seems like some kind of crazy CSI stuff or some kind of crazy movie or something like that, but it happens. It happens locally. Um, it happens a lot, actually. These 
these folks are very well um, learned in the particular disorders that they're trying to show that they have or show that their kids have. You know, they, they are frequenters of WebMD or <laughs> Yahoo Medical or something like that. Um, impulse control, let's just scroll on through these real quick. Uh, kleptomania, folks that, that have issues with stealing. Uh, pyromania, pathologic gambling. And intermittent explosive disorders. These folks just kind of go off. The, these are the folks you say he went off the walk off the deep end and had a short fuse. Um, well, these kind of patients, it's a it's a it's a psychiatric disorder. They got a diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder, but they're still legally held liable if they commit a crime, such as stealing or such as setting something on fire. Um, and so, you know. Again, not real important in, in what we need to know other than just understanding that. Um, getting into some very important ones that we need to know that we're going to deal with. Major depressive disorders. Major depressive disorders. These patients are going to be the ones that um, oftentimes uh, have suicidal ideation, attempt suicide, maybe even follow through with suicide. And it is a um, depressed person, a depressed mood. Things that, that are common with that. Decreased interest in things once found pleasurable. Weight loss or gain. Insomnia. Increased or decreased psychomotor activity. Feelings of worthlessness and guilt. These are the patients that actually feel very hopeless. Like there's no tomorrow. Um, no, we're not trained as psychiatrists or psychologists. But oftentimes, it's, we're going to be the first connection with any help that these patients have. And so it's very important, very, very important that we remain empathetic with them and that we uh, we don't just uh, chalk their uh, suicide attempt up to just an attention thing. And here's my thoughts on that. If, if a person is trying to commit suicide for attention, if they don't get the attention that they need, they may try it again and, and screw up and actually knock themselves off, right? So it is it is an important issue, even if somebody's doing it for attention. But now these patients with major depressive issues, they're not doing it for attention. They're doing it because they have these feelings up here. Periods of persistent, abnormally elevated mood interspersed with periods of depression. Bipolar, schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder. So where do you think some of the issues with these come from? Obviously in the brain, but it, it, it's not necessarily that there's 
brain tissue damage or anything, but it's a, a problem with chemicals. Serotonin, dopamine, certain chemicals, there's an imbalance of them. And so there's certain medications that they have to take that helps with these chemicals. Um, some of the medications that we saw, um, the depressant medications, um, some of those medications, SSRIs, select serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, these medications actually affect dopamine and, and serotonin and melatonin levels in the brain. Um, a bipolar patient oftentimes will be on, on several different types of medications, but lithium is actually the mood stabilizer, and that's the one that they really, really need to get in their system. The thing about bipolar is it's not bipolar like we say in mainstream where, uh, you know, um, Hannah is nice to me to my face and then she's all mean and, and, and two-faced behind me, you know. Oh, well, Hannah, she, she's, got, she's got multiple personalities. She, she's either, you know, real happy to my face or she, she's crazy. I don't know. No, it's not like that. It's not a multiple personality disorder. It's not Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where in the morning I'm one person and in the night I'm somebody completely different. I'm still the same person. I just have different elevations of mood. Now, in most cases with bipolar patients, it's not I'm going to be manic in the morning and depressive at night. It's going to be I'm going to be manic for several weeks, then I'm going to come off that high, and then I'm going to be depressed for a very long time. I've got some theories on this, um, you know, this is just nickisms, but a person that's in the manic phase of, of bipolar, they're very irrational. They, they don't make good decisions. These are the ones that fly out to Las Vegas and spend their, their, their life savings in two days. Or these are the ones that, that go do just extreme things. They go out and just on extreme shopping, buy $40,000 cars and all this kind of stuff. And then it's like, boom, bam, they start looking and they're like, oh crap, what have I done? And then it's like, oh, here I go. That's just kind of my take on it, but again, it is chemical imbalances. Um, manic is, is almost exactly what you would expect with the word manic. They're just... I mean, they're just just not even nothing. It's almost like they've taken, um, almost like what you would expect with somebody that takes meth or something like that. You know, a stimulant that, that except the stimulant doesn't leave their body. It's just like a go 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 go. And all of a sudden, it's just like boom, and then they're uh, they're depressed and hopeless. Um, getting back into depression, uh, so some of our other mental illnesses like bipolar, um, usually diagnosed before the age of 30, schizophrenia is usually diagnosed a little bit later, early adulthood. Um, depression affects every age group. As a matter of fact, one of the higher populations of suicide are adolescents and elderly. You, you've got to have some kind of degree of depression in order to want to knock yourself off. Um, a couple of uh, personality disorders, cluster A, cluster B, cluster C, y'all can read over those. Um, you know, not, uh, not real, real, real important to know these clusters. Uh, cluster B disorders are usually the antisocial um, borderline personality disorders. And then cluster C are usually obsessive people like uh, people with OCD, things like that. The thing about personality disorders is that they're ill-equipped to function in society. Again, we all kind of have a medium, you know, we're not like just completely Especially in EMS, you, you probably are more on the, the type A personality um, than you are really on the other, or if you're not, you will be if you've been in for a, any amount of time. But we're not necessarily just like, oh, I'm flamboyant, hello, I'm out there, whatever, you know, but we're also not just socially awkward either. 
You know, there's kind of that happy medium, you know? Well, these people are, are, are what you would consider, you know, very socially awkward hermits, folks that keep to themselves. They don't do good in social situations. They're very ill-equipped to handle certain aspects. Um, often have t uh, difficulty maintaining jobs and relationships. The problem with it is, is that they don't see a problem. Y'all know any of those kind of people that <laughs> everybody else around them can see what's going on, but they can't see it. Obviously, be rather difficult people to uh, deal with. Don't think we're going to have too much issue with that in the back of the ambulance. Just kind of need to know a little bit. Patients suffering from this type of disorder have lost contact with reality. Panic, bipolar, eating, or psychotic disorder. Psychotic disorders. I'm going to talk about a few of those. So schizophrenia. I actually got nauseated a little bit. <laughs> um, psychotic disorders. You, they've lost contact with reality. Oftentimes, these are the patients that suffer from disorganized thoughts, um, delusions, hallucinations, but they may also just have that flat apex. So your patient is seeing pink ponies running on the ceiling, but you do not. What do you think you suffer from? Hallucinations, delusions, or illusions? Unless you're the one that's crazy and everybody else sees them, you don't. Hallucinations. Hallucinations. Patient sees the cord to a cardiac monitor but thinks it's a snake. He is suffering from... Patient, this patient is convinced he is the holy messiah sent to earth to save the world. In reality, is John Jacobs and works in the EMS department at Southern Union. He is suffering from hallucinations, delusions, or illusions. He is delusional. He is delusional. So hallucinations. These are sensory impulses without any external stimuli. These are I'm seeing something running across the wall. But y'all don't. They're not really there. Something in my mind has altered my perception of, of what I'm seeing, and I'm seeing the pink elephants or the purple ponies or whatever. Illusions. These are where there's it's something that's a real stimulus, but it perceives as something different. As in the case of seeing a cord, but I actually see a snake. Or in this case, a guy's waving, but I'm seeing him as coming to attack me. And sometimes things like illusions can actually run into delusional things. I see this guy, he's waving at me, but I think he's uh, trying to attack me, but now I'm becoming delusional in the fact that everybody's out to get me. And that's what illusions are, are false fixed beliefs. When I was doing... I don't have a ton of experience with... Um, Psychiatric patients, other than um, medically sick psychiatric patients in ICU professionally, but when I was doing clinicals, um, especially nursing clinicals, we went to, um, oh, it, it's one of the uh, psychiatric hospitals in Montgomery, and I went to the first floor in, in East Alabama, too, and 
part of those clinicals is just sitting in their group therapy. And part of those clinicals are just talking to these, these patients. And let me tell you, a person with delusions, delusional thoughts, they are convinced that what they're telling you is real. One in particular, I remember a guy that uh, said that he was the CEO of a multi-million dollar company in New York City, and the government had tapped into his stuff, his bank account or whatever, and they, they had put him in the psychiatric hospital trying to steal his money. I mean, he had a very, a very elaborate story. You know, reviewing back on his files, he was just a local person that had several run-ins with the psychiatric hospital and all things like that. But shoot, listening to him and all that, by the time I was, I was ready to leave, I was ready to give him my contact yeah. information, and then, and, because and, he said, you know, when I get out, I'm going to send you a million dollars. Like, hey, yeah, brother, give me a call. Just because they are really convincing. Now, I knew that it was just a psychiatric issue, but what I'm saying is, is that you got to be very careful, because... You know, it may not be just delusions of grandeur that I'm the holy messiah or that I'm the king of the world. It may be actually them telling you things like, my family's out to get me. They tried to kill me yesterday, and they tried to kill me today. You know, and things like that, because then you run into some medical issues, and you've got to be able to tell, really, what's the delusion and what's the real there. Does that make sense? With illusions and hallucinations, If a person tells you that they see bugs crawling all over the ceiling, they believe they see bugs crawling all, all over the ceiling. What you do not do is go up there and try to start killing them bugs and trying to, to wipe them off your shoulder or whatever. What you do is try to get them back into reality. Reaffirm, there are not any bugs. I'm scared of bugs. I would not be in this room with you if I saw spiders crawling across the ceiling. Or try to reaffirm, this is not a snake. This is just a cord. I would not be holding this if it was a snake. Right? Don't buy into their illusions and their delusions and their hallucinations. One of the things about losing contact with reality, they have impaired reasoning. They can't think. You can't be rational with these type of patients. Catatonic behavior. Do you know what catatonic behavior is? Yeah, yeah. So, and oftentimes this is, this catatonic behavior is a result of a medication, of an antipsychotic medication. Some extremes, these patients will sit motionless and just slaughter and stare and not react to any type of stimuli. In other cases, it might just be just a rigid extremity or something like that. Um... Most schizophrenics, despite what society tells you, are not violent. And as a matter of fact, most patients with schizophrenia can be productive members of society if they do what? Take, Take their medication. Just like folks with bipolar disorder could be productive members of society if they take their medications. So, as part of just losing reality, they lose who they are as a person. They also lose the ability to form relationships and maintain relationships. You'll see personality changes, disorganized ways of, of, of thinking, hypersensitivity to sounds, to sudden movements. These are the patients that you see walking up the road with headphones on. Why do you think they have headphones on? So they can't hear the voices talking to them. There's a guy that hangs out right next to the hospital that is usually sitting on that bench at those apartments. Is he's reading his Bible and he's got headphones on. He's a schizophrenic patient and he has those headphones on so that the voices don't talk to him. Whatever works, I guess. Whatever works. So most of them aren't violent, but you do have an increased risk when those hallucinations become more and more real to them. Or those illusions. Or their auditory hallucinations. Now do you know there's a difference in visual hallucinations. That's seeing 
the, the pink ponies and all that, and then you've got auditory hallucinations, and that's where you've got these voices that are, are telling you to kill yourself or telling you to kill somebody or to do something. Um, if they're not compliant with their medications, or if they have substance abuse problems, or with their medications, there's changes in their medications. One of the, the calls that I had that sticks out the most to me dealing with a schizophrenic patient was several years ago, a new medication to treat uh, psychiatric illness came out called Abilify. So Haldol was a very common, non-conventional psychotic, antipsychotic medication. And then Abilify came out. Well, his doctor changed his, his medication and apparently either the dose wasn't right or the Abilify just didn't work or he just didn't take his medication. We get called to a psychiatric emergency. We get there, and this guy is buck naked. Have I told y'all this story? This guy is buck naked. Just out of reality altogether. Family's there, just mom's just crying, freaking out. Brother's getting mad at him, you know, because he's just like, I, I can't understand why he won't calm down. So we follow him around. He goes into his bathroom, turns his shower on, gets in the shower, gets everything soaking wet. We try to get him out. I mean, again, he's just totally disillusioned. Then he goes and locks himself in the bedroom. Then he agrees to uh, allow one of us to come in. I was like, no, I'll come in, but we're going to keep his door open. Um, then, while he's in the bedroom, he elbows his way out, takes off, and insists this is at a, uh, a residential um, duplex over in Auburn, down off South College Street, runs out the door, takes off up through the duplexes, buck naked. <laughs> the whole time, we're begging the cops, please, help us, help us. And they just, they did not want to get involved with this because once they got involved, then they had to be reporting all that. I'd already called Dr. McFarland and gotten permission to restrain him. But here's the thing about restraining somebody. you got to get them on the street before you can restrain them, right? That didn't do me no good. When I worked over in Georgia, we had how to all that we could give somebody I am, but we didn't have that now then. Even if I could, the jerk was butt naked running a marathon. <laughs> so finally, he comes back. We see him running in. We get the stretcher kind of at the door, ready. He busts through the door, and his brother's sitting there, and his brother bull rushes him. <laughs> Boom! And just throws him on the stretcher. <laughs> at that point, at that point, I jump up. And I'm like trying to straddle him, trying to get his legs tied down, and my partner's up there. And finally, the cops are like, oh, y'all need some help. Yeah, we're good. We're good, guys. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, once we tied him down, he didn't just take that with a grain of salt, right? I was fully convinced that this joker was, was going to come up off that stretcher. We get him loaded to the ambulance, um, and um, I was like, I asked the cop, I was like, Sir, will you please ride with me? You've got guns and pepper spray and, and tasers and stuff. And he's like, uh, well, my supervisor won't let me ride with you, but I'll follow really close behind you with lights and sirens. I was like, no, I don't want that crap. I need you to help me. So bottom line, he followed us in, but I'm on the back of this ambulance with this guy who is basically has, has distorted his body like in a manner to where he's almost off of this stretcher. I call in report and I'm like huffing and puffing and sounding like I was just the one that ran the naked marathon. And, and I'm like, we've got to have some help when we get there because this guy, I mean, he, he was the, that was probably the scariest I've been on the back of the truck, you know. He wasn't a real big guy. He's about my size, you know. I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter, so I don't know if I could have taken him or not, but he was not in his right mind, so it would have come to blows had he gotten off of that stretcher. 
And it all came back to he had some disruption in his medication. They said that normally he's a good student. He, he went to Auburn. Normally he's a good student. You know, would, would never do anything like this. I'm like, yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> but the crazy thing about it is, is that I was um, in nursing school at the time and had a psychiatric clinical on the first floor of East Alabama like a couple of days later. And he was down there. <laughs> really? But he didn't remember a thing. I, I, I just, I said, hey, do you recognize me? He was just like, no. I was like, I can't believe that. I didn't really talk to him about that. I didn't want to, you know, mess up his treatment or anything like that. But all it took was him getting back on a normal regimen of his medication, and he was back okay. Um, that was a situation where it took more proof than it did uh, therapeutic communication, because Sometimes these folks get to an extreme to where they're so out of reality that uh, there, there's no reasoning with them at all. Preoccupation with obtaining and using a substance. Dependence, intoxication, abuse, or de uh, addiction. stuff, but um, believe it or not, there's this thing that, that psychiatric medicine uses called the uh, DSM-IV-TR, it's a diagnostic, and you all can read that, um, but they're the ones that actually list, it's a list of different types of psychiatric disorders. Substance abuse, or substance addiction, is listed as a psychiatric disorder that can be is treatable. So an addiction, a preoccupation with obtaining and using a substance with or without physical dependence. Physical dependence means that my body actually depends on that substance to function. Yeah. My body cannot function like it has for the past however long I've been addicted if I don't have that substance. That's the stuff that causes withdrawal symptoms and things like that. Now, you could have a psychological dependence where your mind thinks you need it, but your body doesn't need it to operate. Um, with these, um, you know, doing a good scene size up, determining what it was, um, if it's a, a narcotic, you know, we got things that we can do, even alcohol. You know, significant intoxication with alcohol can put you into a point where you can't breathe real well, right? Um, addiction and substance abuse can involve legal and illegal substances. I mean, alcohol is legal, right? A person that's addicted to alcohol or cigarettes, nicotine, is addicted to something that's a legal substance, but the addiction is no less than somebody that's addicted to drugs, right? It's still an addiction. It's still something that, that kind of consumes your way of life. The problem is, is that these addictions um, actually not only affect you socially, not only affect you mentally, but they affect you physically, and that's where we may run into some issues. Um, and then some substance abuse is not illegal, but still socially unacceptable. Substance abuse is defined in terms of what is considered socially unacceptable. What is an example of that? It's socially acceptable for me to go out and get it. Piss eyed drunk at Sky Bar on a Saturday night. Right? Live in a college town. That's, that's okay. Society says it's okay. If you use that alcohol because you are abusing alcohol when you're going out getting drunk. What's not socially acceptable is for me to go out and get piss eyed drunk 
every single night, right? Or to sit in my house and get drunk every single night, right? So that's what the difference is. And I told you about physical dependence and psychological dependence. Um, alcohol, we'll talk more about alcohol. We're going to really get into the different kinds of alcohol in the next chapter. Um, the thing about alcohol, the, the beverage alcohol that we drink is absorbed very quickly. That's why you get the effects of being alcohol intoxicated very quickly. Um, it's metabolized in the liver, so excessive alcoholism will affect what? The liver and the pancreas and the GI system. Alcohol abuse, um, excessive amounts of alcohol, actually leads to increased bleeding. Chronic alcohol abuse, there's several effects. Uh, this Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, um, which is actually two syndromes that kind of occur. One occurs before the other, but they always happen together. Um, Wernicke encephalopathy and Korsakoff syndrome are different. Both are due to brain damage caused by lack of vitamin B1, which is common in people with alcoholism. Also common in people who don't absorb food properly. Um, Korsakoff syndrome is a psychosis that tends to develop once the Wernicke symptoms go away. So the Wernicke encephalopathy affects the brain, starts affecting the brain, causes brain damage, and then the, the Korsakoff part of it, or it's just a, a, um, um, a psychosis or, or just memory loss, just altered ways of thinking that doesn't go away. What does BAC stand for? Yeah. One of the, the, the um, biggest things with alcoholism is alcohol withdrawal. You know, in the, in the hospital, if we get a patient who is a confirmed alcoholic, they have surgery or they're in the hospital for an extended amount of time, what do we do? What do, we, you know, what do they do? Yeah, they get a beer. Or they get a glass of wine. Or they get a little liquor. Prescribed to them by the doctor. Now, they don't get enough to get drunk. They get enough to get enough alcohol in them to where their body's not just going nuts. How long have you been up there? Since you, have you dealt with enough any withdrawal patients? A patient with alcohol withdrawal symptoms it, it, it's the, the one of the weirdest things because I can walk into that room, assess that patient, and he be in his right mind and he's talking to me. 30 minutes later, I may walk into that room and he ain't even the same person. He's just, he's just not with it at all. They totally lose any sense of who they are once they start going through those withdrawal symptoms. And they, they become very combative and, and fighting. And, and sometimes they even lose the ability to breathe on their own. And, and sometimes we have to sedate them and innovate them for a few days. And then if they make it through this, because withdrawal symptoms, withdrawal can be deadly to somebody. If they make it through it, and, and in most cases they do, about 72 hours later, you walk into that room and they're fighting you and all that. Walk out 30 minutes later, oh hey, what's going on today? And they don't remember those three days. They're just totally gone. Which two medications in the AMT drug box may be used on a patient suffering from decreased level of consciousness due to alcohol abuse? D50 and thiamine. I'm not going to go back. D50 and thiamine. Why D50 and thiamine? Right, thiamine is going to help with the vitamin B deficiency. And the D50 helps with the sugar content. 
Right. The D50 will help with um, actually just getting some sugar into the cells. Um, just giving them a little bit of nourishment, a little bit of, of, of some little bit of carbohydrate. Y'all need a break? Yeah, okay, we don't have that much more to go. Alright. Next thing we're going to talk about, suicide. Falls under when you're depressed and stuff. 90% of all patients that commit suicide have a mental illness. I venture to say that a very large statistic of those patients who actually follow through with suicide have had episodes where they've attempted suicide in the past. These patients feel hopeless. These patients feel like there's no way out. This is the only way, and the, the world would be much better off without them. We live in the land of opportunity. We live in a world where even when things feel like they're hopeless, there's always hope somewhere. Alright? I'm not just being happy-go-lucky, I'm being truthful. There's always a situation that you can come out of if you get the help that you need. And that's where we need to try to help these patients get that help that they need. If they're having suicidal ideations or they've attempted suicide and didn't fall through, they need help somewhere. That is a cry out for help. Whether they consciously or subconsciously say, I'm crying out for help, they need help. You don't just attempt to kill yourself if everything is clicking on all four cylinders in your brain, right? Third leading cause of death in adolescence. You know, a lot of that goes into just the developmental period of that time. What is one of the big things that adolescents are focused on? Peer. Peer acceptance. Acceptance by their peers. Acceptance by society. Acceptance by everyone. So naturally, if that's one of their big focuses, they start being rejected, being bullied, just not being in that social clique, not finding friends. That's going to be a major life event for them, right? Because they're not able to really rationalize, hey, it's not the end of the world, right? Now, as you get older, you still have that degree of acceptance, but you kind of come to terms with the fact that not everybody's going to like you. If you haven't accepted that now, you need to. Because you're not going to make everybody happy. You're not always going to be in the same uh, same social standing with everybody else, right? But you're able to handle it in a more mature fashion. Why well, lessons aren't able to handle these things in a mature fashion? One of the saddest calls I've ever been on was a adolescent suicide. 16 year old boy around Christmas time. I was working out in Smith Station, me and Dor Dor Dean for partners. We need to call him to a gunshot. We get there, the 16 year old boy had put in a had put a uh, 30 out six right here. That's a high powered hunting rifle right here. I don't want to get too graphic, but if you can imagine what it would do. That was probably the most graphic <laughs> gunshot I've ever been on. And that was so sad to me because the story behind it, his mom and dad had just split up. Dad had run off with another woman. Mom had turned to substance abuse. He had called his dad like a few days before and said, hey, dad, it's getting around Christmas time. I'd like to spend some time with you. Dad was like, oh, okay, um, I'm busy today. I'm busy, you know, but I'll give you a call. Several days went by, I never got a call. Kid was, um, he was deaf, um, or he couldn't hear real well. He had a lot of um, social issues at school, not very well accepted. He was hopeless at that point, you know, and it's just a sad, we can't, we're not going to be world changers. We're not going to go out and just change the whole world for everybody. But if we can actually learn to be empathetic with people, and if we can actually learn that people are people despite what they do, 
we might could end up saving a life just simply by offering them hope, right? Um, <coughs> Drug and alcohol abuse figures substantially into it, so a lot of times that's what they need to get the courage up to do it, is that liquid courage or that, that artificial courage. Method and lethality, uh, they, they vary by gender. Why do you think that is? Why do men, how do men, how do you say men commonly kill themselves? Most often it's going to be gunshot. How do women usually kill themselves? Okay. Usually overdose, right? So why? why? There, there's actually a reason for that. Why do you think that is? <laughs> well, a lot of it just has to do with the fact of disfigurement and, and, and a mess, you know, and women are actually thinking, I don't want anybody to clean up this mess after I do this, or I don't want the last thing that somebody sees of me to be a mutilated body, you know. Um, and most often men don't do it, um, so they usually go out to a, a familiar place, a shed or, or woods or something like that. Um, nonetheless, this is just a really, really sad situation. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation. Um, Just remember with suicide attempts, they, they've, they've lost some coping mechanisms. And, and it all boils down to how can you cope with the stress that's going on in your life? How can you cope with the situation? Um, it's kind of hard to actually... Uh, it's kind of hard to um, walk a mile into my shoes if you've never actually walked that mile yourself, right? So it's hard for us to kind of identify. If we've always been on top of the world or, or we've, we've never really been depressed or, or just super sad or, or something like that. Um, but all it takes is that one instance in your life to where something could change. You never know. You never know. Um, I'm a walking example of that. I got married when I was 19 years old to my high school sweetheart. By the time I was 21, we had divorced. There was issues that went into that that, that were out of my control. Um, that was the biggest life event that had ever happened to me. I was, I mean, I was anybody that you that that, that I worked around then because I was in I was in medicine and all that. Um, they tell you, they, they see a complete change in me. I mean, I lost, I lost like 30 pounds in a month. I had to get on depressive medication. Like, I, I, I seriously lost my way of thinking. Just because of a life event that happened in my life. And so now, one of the, the areas that, that I feel like I can maybe have a hand in or maybe offer hope in is in young males going through relationship issues, you know? Relationship issues don't just happen to females, they don't just affect, affect females, they affect males too, you know? Nonetheless, I never got to the point to where I wanted to just knock myself off, but I can see where it very easily could get, get into that when you start losing any hope, right? The reason why I tell you guys this story is the fact that we've all got things in our lives that may actually bring a little something to our job, right? Now, of course, we don't want to get our personal life mixed in with our professional life, you know? But just the fact that, that to be really empathetic with somebody is, is if you've walked in their shoes before, right? To really understand is to have been understood. And that's what it took for me is that I had to have somebody to understand what I was going through and to help bring myself out of that, right? Now, that was just a situational depression, and, and I haven't struggled with that since then. You know, 10 years later, I had to struggle with it, but just the fact that I, I was there at one point. And there's, there's nobody in this room 
that hasn't had some kind of, of something. It may not be a big life event, but if you, you've, you've had something happen to you before to where you might can relate with a patient a little bit better, whether it's a traumatic accident, you might have been in a car wreck, or you might have had a family member that passed away from a heart attack, or you, you might have went through some other kind of uh, emotional stress or trauma or something like that. Bottom line is, is that it doesn't matter if it's a mental illness, behavioral emergency, or if it is a medical emergency. Empathy and therapeutic communication can be very, very important in providing good quality patient care because it goes beyond just sticking needles into somebody. Anybody can be a skilled IV sticker or a skilled drawing up medication in person, right? But to really be a skilled patient care provider is to have interpersonal skills, to have empathy, to care, to be a humanitarian, all right? Um, getting back to suicide, treat all suicide deaths as a crime scene because you don't know that for sure, right? You don't want to. Um, law enforcement and medical examiner's office must investigate to determine if it was a suicide or what else, or, you know, homicide or something like that. Um, here's an interesting statistic. The rate of suicide in those over the age of 85 years is 1.8 times that of the general population. So the highest population of suicide is the old, old, over 85 years old. All right, the last little section, violent patients. We talked about the uh, signs of impending violence. Be sure law enforcement is on scene. Now, here's one thing to remember about restraints. If a patient is handcuffed, whether we, they're handcuffed to a rail or they're in cuffs. An officer has to be with that patient. You cannot take off on your ambulance with a patient that is in handcuffs. Because what happens if you need to free that patient? You don't have a key, right? I mean, I don't keep a handcuff key on my, my keychain, y'all may. They're not considered an acceptable restraint for us unless a um, law enforcement officer is with us. Um, I'm going to play a little video if it works, um, but the sound, I couldn't get it hooked up into this, so you're going to have to listen really closely. I don't think it's going to be loud enough. Occasionally, patients will need to be physically restrained during an... Oh, man. Can you hear that at all? Occasionally, patients will need to be physically restrained during ambulance transport. These patients are usually severely agitated, combative, and violent for a multitude of reasons. Keep in mind that medical emergencies can cause a patient to become unruly. For example, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, head injury, overdose, etc. Ambulance transport is indicated because these patients do require medical care, whether they realize it or not. When the determination has been made that the patient is a danger to himself or others, reasonable force and restraint is used. This reasonable force is the minimum amount of force used to control the patient. The goal is to restrain the patient, not to hurt them. Physical restraint is always the last option. First responders should always attempt verbal persuasion first. Never attempt to restrain a patient alone. Positional asphyxia has been reported in the literature when patients have been hogtied or restrained in a manner that impairs breathing. Patients should be restrained in a face-up or lateral position, not face down. Follow local protocols when restraining uncooperative patients. In many areas, Law enforcement or medical control must authorize restraint and treatment of patients against their will. You will need the following. Soft restraints, 
Sufficient personnel, one person per extremity at a minimum. Surgical mask or oxygen mask. BSI equipment. Wide tape. Sheets. Always consider physiological causes in a patient's behavior. Make sure the patient is not carrying a weapon. You can perform a pat-down during the patient's assessment. Attempt to determine what triggered the patient's unruly behavior. Quickly perform a scene assessment. Make sure that the scene is safe. Law enforcement should be required to intervene if the patient is extremely combative or wielding a weapon. Always have an exit plan and stay at least an arm's distance from the patient. All these factors should be incorporated into your assessment. When application of soft restraints is called for, take the following steps. Take BSI precautions. Plan your actions ahead of time. At least four people are required to restrain a patient. Each person should be pre-assigned a limb to restrain. Rescuers should act all at once to overwhelm the patient. Attempt to grab clothing or large joints. Avoid placing pressure on the neck or chest. Avoid the mouth, as some patients may try to bite rescuers. A first responder should be assigned to reassure the patient throughout the procedure. Secure all four limbs with restraints approved by local protocols. The patient should be secured on the ambulance gurney in a supine or lateral position. If the patient is spitting at rescuers, a surgical mask or oxygen mask connected to oxygen can be placed over the patient's face. If the patient's face is covered, monitor the airway carefully. Continually monitor distal circulation in restrained extremities. Once restrained, do not leave the patient at any time. Consider having extra personnel in the ambulance's patient compartment during transport. Monitor ABCs during transport. Do not remove restraints unless sufficient personnel are available to control the patient, usually at the hospital. Document why and how the patient was restrained. Constantly reassess distal circulation in restrained extremities during transport. Also, ABCs should always be monitored in the restrained patient. Patients that calm down may actually be deteriorating, so be vigilant. Attempt vital signs every 15 minutes if patient is stable. During a scuffle is not the time to learn how to apply restraints. Be familiar with the soft restraints that are carried in the ambulance. Soft restraints are commercially available, but can be improvised with clean bandages or sheets and wide tape. If the patient continues to struggle violently, requiring multiple people for restraint, consider ALS resources for chemical restraint. Okay. So what are the key uh, considerations when the decision is made to leave the strength? Mm -hmm. All right, follow through. Once you've made that decision, you've got to go all the way through it. It's all or nothing. All right, we've got to consider why we're using the restraints. Are there medical issues that's causing this? Um, how many people do we have to help us? Do we need to ask more people? And can we do it safely? Do we have the equipment? Also, you want to preserve the patient's dignity. Again, they are they they are a person. Monitoring patient safety, and you don't use them punitively. You don't use them as punishment. If you don't act right, I'm going to restrain you. All right. You don't hold those over a patient's head. You use them only as a safety mechanism to safely transport a patient so that he doesn't harm himself or you or others. 
And then how many people are needed to restrain one person? Four. Why? Do what? So it's really supposed to be five. You got one that's going to be to reassure them and to monitor airway and, and one at each extremity. All right. So, in summary, behavioral emergencies can have situational, mental, or uh, physiological, physical uh, causes. Your safety, your patient safety, bystander safety can be at risk and are of utmost importance. And if necessary, request law enforcement, and I would say that it would probably be necessary if you're dealing with a behavioral emergency. Uh, therapeutic communication is going to be your most essential element of assessment and management and be non-judgmental and empathetic with all patients. All right? Any questions?